Irish. I think his second base or center field was the exact spot where Babe Ruth's dad had a bar when Babe Ruth was a kid. Pete was all about winning, you know? And of course, this whole gambling thing kind of ruined his. He was just a young kid, and he came up, and he, he was he was really talented. I mean, he, he, he would have gone all the way. You know, and then they kind of put him in the game to make you think the camera's like right out on the field. You know? <laughs> they didn't have the center field cameras like they do nowadays, but it's just some of the old technology they used to try to use. Yeah. It was great. I mean, yeah. People loved it. When I was a kid, I used to watch the Saturday game with Kurt Gowdy and Tony Kubek. <laughs> and I'm, I'm uh, standing in there, and what I did was I, I took the rubber and, and I just notched it out and I put a piece of aluminum foil uh, underneath it and so that this thing it, it, it would mm -hmm. take a little while for it to break loose and, and it would just worked out perfectly it curved okay and, and so I'm, I'm sitting in there and so I, I go up and and uh, uh, normally I, I, I would bat left-handed but but uh, uh, and so on, on this particular day you know the, the ball comes in and, and I, I'm thinking you know you only have a fraction of a second I mean to figure out Baseball, baseball, Richard Wood and Dick Miller. You know, Pete Rose is in Marion Federal Prison after he's, he got arrested you know, for whatever. I forget what he did. But anyway, he was, he was arrested. And I was just saying earlier how uh, you imagine the Marion Prison baseball team with Pete Rose <laughs> playing for him. He must have been coaching while he was playing. I wonder what his batting average was. <laughs> You imagine if you hit a home run or got a double O off one of these other prisoners and they like, I'm going to shank you for that. <laughs> yeah, the, the thing, uh, uh, some of these old baseball parts, you know, uh, like uh, you know, up in Boston, uh, mm -hmm. you were having the, the, the short left field. Yeah, and and I, I don't know if you remember uh, Old League Park where the you know, Cleveland Indians played. Uh, that, that was the... Right field was a short, it was mm -hmm. like uh, 270 oh, yeah. feet out there for a home run. I, I, no, I, I played uh, uh, some, some uh, on a travel team, that we, we played a few games there. And, and when I would go there, I, I would always, I, I would hit, pinch hit and, and try, try to hit the ball to right field because it was so darn close. And, and uh, a See, couple of times I, I bounced it off the, off the, you know, the wall, but I, I, I never did get a home run there. Fields back then were, they had characteristics, and nowadays they're starting to get back to that. But I remember like Crosley Field in Cincinnati had the slope in left field going up to the fence. Yep. So the outfielders actually played on an incline. You know, and of course you had Wrigley yeah. with the Ivy, and you had Fenway, old Forbes Field in Pittsburgh. Yeah. You know, and then in the 70s they all got generic. All the field, and it was terrible. AstroTurf, all round stadiums, the dimensions were, you know. So now they've gotten back. Baltimore built that uh, Camden Yards, and which I think his second base or center field was the exact spot where Babe Ruth's dad had a bar when Babe Ruth was a kid. Because oh. Babe Ruth was in Baltimore, you know. And um, the actual spot of the, where the field is now is where his dad's bar was. But, you know, they built that one, and then, like, Atlanta's got their new stadium, and, and, they, and they're all really just kind of a throwback now. To, they have the... Uh, individual like uh, their dimensions are different like in arizona they got a part of their center field fence is 413 feet i saw last night that's deep oh that's deep yeah yeah but uh duval hit a 483 foot home run the other night <laughs> well, you know you, you, if you hit it be, be between the the, the fielders out there uh, and you get the thing to roll out to the wall mm -hmm. i mean that that's if you're Decent runner. Yeah. You're good for a home run there. Yeah, Eddie Rosario hit for the cycle the other night. He had a double his first time up. This is in San Francisco. He had a triple his second time up. Third time up, he had a home run over the right field fence. And then his last time up, he just poked a single. Yeah. And as soon as he got to first base, he's like, throw me the ball. Throw me the ball. <laughs> you know, kind of down the switch of gears, but Dean and I were watching a, a, a game last Sunday out at uh, L.A. Have, have you seen that stadium out there? Yeah, the Dodgers? No, the... Uh, the, 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 the This is for, for the football team. Oh, football. Yeah, I mean, $200 million yeah. that they poured into that. Uh, it, it is incredible. And not only that, but two teams use it. 
the Rams and the uh, Chargers both use it. Well, they do. They're supposed to be building another stadium for one of those teams, the Angels are the Chargers, I think. But, you know, the Chargers moved to Los Angeles. They used to be in San Diego. Yeah, yeah. So they're both using the same field. Well, so, I, it has been kind of a, L.A. has been having trouble keeping a team out there for some reason. Yeah. Yeah, there was a time there, a short period of time, where the Rams had moved to St. Louis and uh, the Raiders had moved back to Oakland. And of course, you had San Diego. There were no, there was no football team in Los Angeles. And you had the same thing with Baltimore. You know, yeah. Baltimore Orioles. Uh, you know, they they, they go from uh, out to St. Louis. And, uh, I mean, uh, jumping around there. I mean, uh, well, there were the St. Louis Browns. Then they moved to Baltimore and became yeah. New York. Yeah. But that's where the Yankees came from. They were the they were in Baltimore and they moved yeah. up to New York and became the Highlanders, yeah. and then the Yankees later with the house that Ruth built. Yeah, the, what really amazed me was the St. Louis Browns with Pete Gray. Yeah, one arm. One arm, and the guy, uh, he, 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 you would never think it would be possible, but the guy could hit some home runs. I mean, he, he what did he have, about eight, nine, uh, ten to a four yeah, a year? It wasn't a whole lot, but still, just the fact that a one arm guy could. One, one arm guy? Yeah. Yeah. And then he played outfield. So. And, and, he'd pick and, the ball up, flip it up, put the glove under his stump, right. and he'd catch the ball with his bare hand and throw it in. Yeah, yeah. And to do it so fast, though. It, it, the, the guy was just, but, yeah, they made the movie of it. Yeah. I mean, because hell, he, he, was, yeah. he was so unique. And later, he played during World War II when a lot of the players were gone to the I'm war. Sure. Yeah. So that's why he got a chance to play. That's how Eddie Goodell, the midget, got a chance to get him at yeah. bat. And yeah. He walked on four pitches. And that was removed for a pinch hitter. Well, see, he, the, the guy that taught me how to play baseball, Gene Woodley, you know, he, he, he he was really something that, uh, during World War II, I mean, he had to go into the military, and, and so he, he didn't really get started. He, you know, he, he was signed before uh, World War II broke out, but he didn't get to the majors until after the war was over. I think he still played for like 14 years, something like that. Uh, he, he, still he played for career. 14 years. Yeah. He, I, I believe it was... Uh, uh, 20, 2004 when he passed. Mm -hmm. I, I, I remember his, uh, his wife uh, gave me a telephone call mm -hmm. and uh, told me about it. That was, that was really a, a sad day for me. Yeah. yeah. So that's, he lived to 04, that's a, that's a long life. Well, see, he had, he had, uh, well, actually, he, he was uh, only in his mid-70s. Really? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, he, 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 but uh, just such a wonderful guy. And, and, and what, what he would pick me, and, and my gosh, we used to go and, and see uh, the Homestead Grays play. I mean, you remember the, the, the black uh, teams? Yeah. I mean, talk about some real ball players. I mean, well, it kind of helped, didn't it, that Gene Woodling, you were, he was boarding at your house, wasn't he? he, he yeah, they were football paying rent you know, because it was during the Depression. And, uh, he, his dad uh, didn't have very much money. And, and of course, nobody had a whole lot of money back then. Yeah. But, uh, but he, he was uh, four, four times. He had, uh, had, had the batting record. I mean, he, he was just, just a, a great, great guy. You know, originally major league teams didn't have numbers on their uniforms, yeah. and the Yankees, they numbered and they, they numbered like the batting order. That's why Ruth was number three, Garrett was number four, and then later they switched that. But but you figure all the numbers the Yankees have retired or they can retire. I, don't know, I think number one was Billy Martin, two a uh, Derek Jeter, three is Babe Ruth, four Garrett, number five was DiMaggio. I don't know who number six was, but seven was Mantle, eight was Yogi Berra. Yeah. Who's number, who was number nine? Do you remember who a nine was? I, I, I do not. Yeah, know. I can't remember. But I'm just saying that all those numbers, these guys are all Hall of Famers. I'm not sure about Billy Martin, but, you know, yeah. they retire all those numbers, they're going to start <laughs> having to go to three-digit numbers for too long. I, I remember uh, when I was a kid, uh, everybody hit... It seemed like Akron was not that big of a city, you know, maybe 350,000 people. It's pretty big. And, 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 and uh, every year I, I was always, uh, you know, in, in, 
and the All Stars and stuff like that. Though. And you know, I, I never thought it was a contact sport. I never thought I'd ever get hurt. And then got wiped out with my arm. I just yeah. threw it out. And they didn't know that very much about the, how to operate on your arm and, and save it, didn't yeah. they? And the conditioning. You know, pitchers back then threw way too many innings. Yeah. You know. And they'd stay in. You'd have a 15 inning game, and then sometimes you have the same pitcher pitch the whole game. But if you hadn't have been wiped out in baseball, you would have never uh, gone through a path in life that led you to reinvent the modern baseball in the first place. I'm, I'm sorry? You would have never followed a path that allowed you to reinvent the modern baseball if you had become a baseball player. Well, no. I, 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 my, my career was supposed to be in baseball. I, I, that, that was what my plan was. I, I never thought I'd ever get hurt. Oh, but uh, you need to answer yeah, so, somebody else. I mean, I, I got answering there. Some people picked that up. Yeah, it's just. Uh, yeah, but it, it yeah. was it was a, it was a lead pipe system. I, I was going to be signed, but uh, and then uh, I had to have a what they call now a Tommy John operation. Mm -hmm. I mean, my gosh! I, first, I, I had a cyst on on, on my elbow, and, and uh, I. I then, then, then I, I, I had the ulnar nerve go out. I, you know, I, I threw the thing. I, I was, you know, somebody bunted the ball. I played third. I, I had to. Uh, I was off balance when I threw it and, and screwed up my arm. And uh, so the next thing I know, I, I have to go in the hospital and have an operation. And, and uh, I think I heard mine just trying to throw curveballs when I was a kid. And then much later, as an adult, I hear Tom Glavin, you know, the Braves, oh, the great Braves pitcher, and he said. You shouldn't throw curves when you're a kid. He said, if you can spot your fastball, like if you can hit a corner with your fastball, and you can throw a changeup, so you don't need you, you never need to throw a curveball. And but when you're a kid, you just want to throw that big breaking curve or or a sharp breaking slider, and if you you don't know the proper techniques, and you end up screwing your shoulder up or your yeah, elbow. Yeah. And so that's why I ended up playing first base because I didn't have to throw the ball that much playing first. Like it seemed like it, it was. Uncanny uh, with, with me the way I, I played the third base, and, and I, I had a, a, a rifle arm. Uh, you know, because I, I worked out and I, I used to do all kinds of uh, tennis ball squeezing and things, and, and building up the, the triceps and, and biceps, and, and uh, because it, I knew that that was going to help. And uh, when, when I was trying to develop a ball for the little league. Uh, Dr. Creighton Hill and I, uh, we got together and, and went over a lot of this stuff. And, and uh, we, we were trying to figure out, was there some way that we could come up with uh, uh, a, a program that would, that would you be able to pick out somebody that could be a future baseball player? Because it, uh, lots of money had been spent, uh, I remember, a, I don't remember the name of the guy, but the, he was the first $100,000 guy uh, that was given $100,000 to sign a contract, never made it to the majors. I mean, that was down the tooth, and that was when $100,000 was way up there, I mean, in, in today's terms. Hmm. Big bonus babies. Yeah. Tell me about the hustler, Pete. Oh, How did he get the, Pete what, Rose? Yeah. Charlie Hustle. Charlie Hustle. Yeah, uh, that, that was his nickname. And didn't he? He came up as a second baseman in '65, I think, with the Reds. And, but like I said earlier, once they got Joe Morgan to play second, they moved Pete to the outfield. And then over his career, he played third a little bit. He played first base later in his career, but he was an outfielder for a long time. But he hustled. I mean, it didn't matter if he had a ground ball to short and he knew he was going to get thrown out. He still hustled the first base. He. Uh, like I said, the 1970 All-Star game, he took out Ray Fossey at the plate with the winning run and ended Fossey's career pretty much. Fossey still played, but he was never as good as he was yeah. before yeah. that. And uh, Pete was all about winning, you know. And of course, this whole gambling thing kind of ruined his. What about that hustle where the ball fell out of the catcher's mitt? Yeah, it was in the, when he was playing for the Phillies late in his career in the World Series, somebody hit a pop-up by the dugout. And the catcher, I think it was Darren Dalton, I'm not sure. But anyway, it hit his mitt and it popped out. And luckily, Pete Rose was standing right there and he whipped out his first baseman's mitt and caught it. It was out. 
you know, the runner would have, I mean, the batter would have got another swing, you know, it just because Pete was there. He hustled all the time. Yeah. You know, he, Charlie Hustle. Yeah, always. I'm sorry that he wound up blowing that career with the gambling yeah, episode. Well, he he, he should have. should be in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. He, he, he certainly deserved the whole thing. I mean, he earned it. Yeah. But, but then uh, he, he made some foolish. Him and Shoeless Joe. Yeah. But I think Pete Rose is a guy that, I mean, he had talent, but I don't think he wasn't like a modern day Mike Trout or somebody. He was, he was a guy that had to work at it, and I think he used everything he could and hustle was part of it you know and to, to make a make his own niche and he made it and he stayed healthy he played consistently for however many years and he hit the ball you know and well, with with gene woodling one thing that he taught me he said if you ever want to amount to anything in baseball so you have to work, work, and then go back and work some more. He said, you, know, you, you have to dedicate your entire life to just one place. He said, you can't be a football player or a basketball mm -hmm. player and, and be a baseball player. You can't be all three. He said, you can't be two. He says, you can only be one. But a couple of people have proved him wrong. As you well know, you're playing baseball and yeah, Not and too football. many, though. No, about, only about two or three. I mean, yeah, it, it's a small number. I know uh, Deion Sanders and uh, Bo Jackson and exactly. Brian Jordan. Uh, yeah. You know, Dave DeBusher, the famous New York Knicks basketball player, he was he had a baseball card. I think he came up with the White Sox, but he didn't last. He started playing basketball instead. But I remember him on a baseball card, like from 64, 65, somewhere around there. And there may have been other ones. I know Michael Jordan played minor league baseball. I don't yeah. think he, I don't know, he yeah. you know, a good athlete is a good athlete. You know, they can, some of them are super athletes. My, uh, uh, Bo Jackson, man, he never should have went back to football. He was so much natural talent in baseball. He could have probably played for I don't know how many more years. Yeah. But he went back to the Raiders and blew his hip out. And, um, yeah. He still played some more baseball after that, but he, he had lost his speed pretty much, you know. Yeah. He hit the longest home run in Kansas City, so I don't remember the number, but I remember it went all the way deep center field over the fountains and out. It was the longest home run in their history. <laughs> yeah, it must have been a live baseball. Yeah. That, before I came around, there, there were a lot of those around. And then what we had to do was come up with the coefficient of restitution, you know. <laughs> make and, consistent and, baseballs. Yeah, make, make consistent baseballs and softballs out of you. You know, the old baseballs back in the day, they, the lighting, even when they started lighting fields, the lighting wasn't that great. But before then, the baseball, the, the, the light would start to get dust in these long games, and they didn't want to stop the game, you know. So they tried to keep playing, but the baseballs, they didn't switch them out like they did today. So they were gray and kind of blended in with the background. And so you had the, was it the Cleveland Indians got hit in the head and died at the plate yeah. because you couldn't see the ball, you know? Yeah. And, and there was a, a picture for uh, the uh, Cleveland Indians. I don't remember his name. He, he, was a, he was just a young kid and he came up and he, he was... He was really talented. I mean, he, he, he would have gone all the way. And uh, he got hit with a, a, a battered ball off, off, off the, uh, the batter. He hit it so hard, a line drive hit him, hit in the head. And he was never right after that. He, he was, there was something, I, I guess he was so traumatic. Oh, yeah. Tony Canigliero in the 60s got hit. He was an outfielder and he got hit while he was batting and it, it blinded him. So I don't know if he ever got his sight back, but uh, it ended his career. And the one thing I was noticing on Sunday is the helmets. Have you noticed how big the helmets are today? I mean, there, there's about this much room in the back. They're trying, it, they're trying to stop concussions as much as they can. Yeah. They were talking today about the, the last player that had the just the one bar face mask, the best left-handed pitchers in baseball history. And obviously Steve Carlton, Warren Spahn, 
Tom Glavin's on the list. He's like fifth or sixth. Yeah. But they had a lot of left-handed uh, relief pitchers on there, like Joe Franco and, God, I forget who all. But in my mind, these guys that come in and close the game, I don't know. There should be a different category for them because I don't care if the guy's got 500 saves. To me, he's not Steve Carlton or Warren Spahn, you know, or Tom Glavin that went out and had 300 some odd victories, you know. So I don't know. And I just kind of took me by surprise that there were so many relief pitchers on the the list. Who, who was the guy that used to talk about the, uh, something? They would use his name, and, and, and if, you, uh, if, if he was in, then you wanted to pray for rain. Wasn't it? it was Spawn and Sane and pray for rain. Yeah. Johnny Sane pitched for the Milwaukee Braves and Warren Spawn. But that was their only two really good starting pitchers. So spawn same, pray for rain. Well, but back then, I mean, <clears throat> you, you, you were lucky to have two good starters. Yeah. And, and then uh, I remember uh, Atlanta having a three, I mean, <clears throat> really good starters. They, they did in the 90s, yeah. yeah. Well, they had four for a while when Steve Avery was doing well. Well, Steve, Steve Avery, I, I had a friend of mine that rented the house to Steve Avery, and, and I thought, why would this Steve Avery rent this house from my friend? Because the house is not air conditioned. It did not have air conditioning in Georgia. Mm. <laughs> and, and the guy was uh, paying a, a heck of a, a, a lot of money, I mean, to, to rent that thing. My goodness, I don't know. <laughs> it was crazy, yeah. Yeah, when they had John Smoltz and Tom Glavin and Greg Maddox, there was no better three pitchers on any team. Right, yeah. And you know, they got, they got John Smoltz. This is great. Doyle Alexander was pitching for the Braves, and he was like 9-0. and He was having a great year. When the Tigers were in the pennant race, so they traded Doyle Alexander to the Tigers, and he helped them out. I mean, he went to the World Series, I think. But they got John Smoltz in return, who was a nothing. He was like minor leader still. Or right. Just, and look what he became. You know. He, the, he was a great... <laughs> he was a great starter. great starter, and then later in his career, he was a relief pitcher, and he did very well at both. But it's just some of these trades, how they work out, you know, because Doyle Alexander was coming to the end of his career, but he was having a very good, and he helped the Tigers. I don't remember what year, but he helped the Tigers do, do their thing, and they gave up Smoltzy, and look at what he did for the Braves, you know? Yeah. yeah. And then the Braves signed Greg Maddox. I'm not sure. I don't think they trade. I think he was a free agent, I think. I don't, I don't remember. But they got Maddox, and Maddox is one of the greatest right-handers to ever pitch. Right, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, they, they, the Braves had some really great uh, players then. Tom Glavin announces some of their Braves games now. He's he's kind of switches out with Jeff Francoeur to provide the color commentary. And Glavin's pretty good. I, li I like listening to him. Oh, there was a guy for the Cleveland Indians that uh, used to, uh, he was an announcer. And this was back to my era when I was a kid. And, and this is when you, you would get all these tapes that, that would come in, and, and uh, the announcer would, would look at these tapes, and, and uh, th th this one guy had, had been a pro ball player for Cleveland years and years before. And, and he, uh, he made the sound baseball came to life. I mean, he, he would pull off these tapes and, mm. and, and uh, uh, there is a Warren Spawn that you know, he, he looks down at the, the catcher, he gets a signal and, and he says, he's winding up. Here it comes. I'm, that, he, he, he's not even in the in the same ballpark where all this baseball is going they, on. They have sound effects. There's the bat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was wonderful. And you know, when they used to televise some of the old games in the 50s and 60s, there was always one shot where the guy would be like doing this and the camera's like right there looking in his face. And they would shoot all those before the game, you know, and then they'd kind of put them in the game to make you think the camera's like right out on the field. You know? <laughs> they didn't have the center field cameras like they do nowadays, but it's just some of the old technology they used to try to use. You know? It was great. I mean, yeah. People loved it. When I was a kid, I used to watch the Saturday game with Kurt Gowdy and Tony Kubek were down. So, <clears> and I didn't care who was playing. It was like every Saturday I watched that game. And it was just, then Joe Garagiola took over announcing. And I just, I loved it, you know. And of course, once I got cable and the old TBS and watched the Braves practically every day. And now I do it on MLB TV. I watch them almost every day since I ain't working. <laughs> just about every night, me and my wife sitting there watching the Braves. 
Well, how are the Braves doing right now? They've still got a three-game lead over the Phillies. Okay. They've won four in a row. They're going. They play in Arizona again today. Right now, it started. As a matter of fact, how many more games do we have? About eleven or twelve. Oh. They got to go from Arizona to play the Padres for three and a half games because one of them's a makeup. They got and they got to make up half a game, and then they go back to Atlanta and they play. I think the Phillies three and the Mets three. And that Phillies is going to be critical. That's. But well, what was so? Uh, I'm trying to think back. Oh yeah, it was when uh, Bob Feller came back from uh, being in the Navy during World War II. My my uh, brother took me up to uh, meet me at, at the the. the uh, stadium that uh, Cleveland had, and, and uh, at that time, I, I think the attendance was supposed to be like ninety thousand. Mm -hmm. That's incredible for well, a baseball game. Okay, but what was so out amazing to me that you never see this uh, any place? But uh, he, uh, Bob Feller was playing against Hal Newhouser. You know, the, he played with the Tigers, the left-hander, and, and it was a, a great. Matchup between the two, and and think about uh, Bob Feller. I mean, the the attendance. My my brother was. I, I'm on his shoulders, watching uh, up up in and nosebleeds the, the part of the stadium, mm -hmm. and, and but I have never seen that uh, there was any kind of attendance record set for this game between Bob Feller and and Hal Newhouser. It, it was, there was standing room only. Yeah. There were no seats available. Yeah, I don't and, know. And so something must have been wrong with, with the attendance or Yeah, who knows? I don't know if they even kept that close to track back then. Yeah. I don't know. You know, they built the stadiums a little smaller now. It's like the Braves, if they're sold out, I think it's only like 38, 39. Okay. And so Bob Feller was only able to, the Go to one World Series. That, that was when the, the you know, 48. yeah, back in '48. Played the Braves, and it was, he, he did not get to start one game. That, that was so disappointing to me. I, I thought uh, uh, Joe uh, uh, Boudreau had, had really blown that one, and they, they didn't win. Yeah. yeah, Feller was cool. I met him once at a card signing. He signed an eight by ten picture for me down in Fort Walton back in the mid '80s. I still got it at home somewhere. But uh, it wasn't real crowded that day, so it was like he just started talking to me. We had a chat for about ten minutes, and uh, but he was talking. He wasn't talking about baseball. He was talking about restoring tractors. That was his hobby was to get old tractors and restore them to, to new condition. Yeah. And I wish, in retrospect, I wish that I'd have had the the mental capacity to ask him some questions because you know when when they clocked his fastball when he threw it with a motorcycle going by him. And they tried to, they timed which got the, the ball. But he was in a suit. He wasn't even in uniform. And and I wanted to ask him about that. But of course, I got tongue tied. I couldn't come up with stuff to ask him, you know, because he's a legend, you know. And uh, the picture that he did sign was just taken. It was a spring training picture with him in uniform. So I said, I, I thought later, man, I would like to have one a picture of him throwing against that motorcycle. And have them autograph it, you know. That would have been a great picture. I, I, I remember Dudley Sports asked me uh, to develop a, a baseball uh, for pitching machines, and, and specifically, uh, it was uh, an iron mic uh, pitching yeah. machine. So I, I had this uh, outside my factory, and I had a batting cage there, and and, and so I, I come up with this uh, baseball. It, it was uh, it was just for batting practice. And, and so here I was using a, a, what made it easy to make a ball that they wanted it to curve. And, and so I, I, uh, I have this my machine saw set up and, and, and I'm, I'm uh, standing in there and what I did was I, I took the rubber and, and I just notched it out and I put a piece of aluminum foil uh, underneath it and so that this thing, it, it, it would Mm -hmm. Take a little while for it to break loose, and, and it just worked out perfectly. It curved, okay. And, and so I'm, I'm sitting in there, and so I, I go up and, and uh, 
Uh, no, normally, I, I, I would bat left-handed, but, but uh, uh, and so on, on this particular day, you know, the, the ball comes in, and, and I, I'm thinking, you know, you only have a fraction of a second, I mean, to, to figure out what's going to happen. And so I, I'm thinking in this fraction of a second, this ball ain't going to curve. <laughs> Bam! I, well, I got struck and <laughs> broke two of my ribs. <laughs> Holy mackerel! I, I mean, for, for two weeks I'm suffering. I've you know, got tape all over me and everything. And, and so I, I go back, and, and so this time I, I, I get in the the, uh, the, the, the right-handed hitter on that side, you know. And, and so here again, I mean, this ball's coming at me, and, and bam! I, 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 hell, this is the second time. No, I'm over on this side. I have a little bad hits. And, and I call Doug, and you know, I says, forget about this ball. I, 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 somebody's going to get killed, you know, and, and uh, somebody's going to get hurt, and somebody's going to get sued. Uh, there is no way I'm going to go pursue this yeah. uh, anymore. But but the only thing I proved from that was I could make a ball from a pitching machine yeah. curve. You just couldn't control yeah. it. And, and it, but it, it would do all kinds of things depending on because it was put in a a, a rack randomly, mm -hmm. and so when it came in, yeah. you know, it, it uh, you, you didn't know. Uh, whether it was going to go to the right or to the left, I mean, it just, you know, these two instances, it just happened to fool me. It's been a long time since I've been in a batting cage, but I remember going in one and the balls were all dimpled like golf balls because they, they would throw them straight. Because that's why a golf ball is dimpled, to, yeah. to try to give it a straighter flag. Yeah, well, yeah, sure. And yeah. it, but these, these, were, these were balls the size of baseballs, yeah. but they had dimples like a golf ball, and that's what it threw. And plus, they were kind of... Uh, softer they were deadened a little bit but so i don't know what kind of speed they threw them to but well yeah. what, what uh, this uh, machine what i did was uh i, I took what was the average speed that uh, it, which was 93 miles per hour uh, I, I had come up with, I, I had all kinds of uh, statistics and things and, and so I, so I had to set the machine for 93 miles per hour. That's easy enough to predict it and to uh, get the machine to throw. And, and so I, I get it all set up and, and so uh, that's what the speed was. It came in at 93 miles per hour. It was a 93 mile an hour curve. It wasn't a wonder you weren't going to hit it. <laughs> yeah. They don't throw curves that hard. <laughs> Maybe a slider every once in a while. Well, that's what happened to me. I mean, I, I was full down my uh, socks. You know, nowadays they're throwing 101 mile an hour fastballs and a changeup at like 89, 90 miles an hour changeup. <laughs> that's incredible. I, don't know. I mean, because th th this is the norm now. I mean, Bob, Bob Feller, I mean, uh, we don't really know how fast his fastball not was. Really, not really. They're, they're, because then we did not have uh, any device that was accurate enough to uh, tell how fast the ball was thrown. There was a good show on Netflix called Fastball. And that's all it was about was fastball pitchers. And they tried to measure Walter Johnson. They tried to measure Feller. And you know, they, they come up with estimates. And that's all it was. And you know, like Nolan Ryan, they used to measure the balls right before home plate with the old Jugs gun, radar gun. But now, like with, with all this Chapman and the really hot, they measure it like right after the ball leaves the pitcher's hand. And the ball's traveling faster at that point. So then they have to go back and estimate, well, if Nolan Ryan threw 100.9 100 miles an hour measured in front of home plate, how fast was it going when he left his hand? How much time do you have to react? It's fractions of a it's second. Fractions and that's why you see these players, like I'll watch them all the time, every day, and somebody will throw a, a slider or something. And the ball's coming in at the lower part of the plate, the batter starts to swing, and then it falls off a table, you know, it just drops and they can't stop their swing. So they look like an idiot. You, you'll see them, they'll do this little half swing and, or they'll, they'll just totally sell it and they'll screw themselves into the ground trying to hit it. And some, and people wonder why, like I got in a conversation on Facebook with the Atlanta Braves fan that says, why don't they bring up Shea Langoliers, the, the fame, the big catcher they got in minors, you know, he needs to maybe be playing in the majors. Well, he's only a double A. And he has never seen these sliders that they pitch in the majors. Yeah. They brought him up; it wouldn't do nothing but destroy his confidence. You know, you got to let him. He won't be up with the Braves till 20, 23, or twenty-four before he'll be on the Braves, and he'll be a good catcher when he gets up there. But you can't rush these things. You yeah. know, they brought up Christian Pache at the beginning of the year. He's like their number one minor leaguer, rated minor leaguer right now. He's an outfielder, 
and they brought him up and started him in center field, and he couldn't hit nothing. I mean, he was only up for a month or so, and he's he's been in the minors the rest of the year because they bring him up too quick. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not ready for major league pitching, not at all. Well, see, uh, they, they, uh, they 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 have been a tremendous investment, mm -hmm. and, and so that they, they want to. Uh, you know, everything is about making money, and, and so you better have a good team. And they're trying to get him up there, but rushing doesn't help. I mean, he has to mature and, and come up uh, when he's ready. His you know, body is ready. There's been a few players that went straight from amateur to the major leagues. The last one I know of is Bob Warner for the Braves, the third baseman. And and he he did pretty well. And Reggie Jackson, I believe, back in the '60s, he went from Arizona State right to the major. Pretty well. I mean, I thought he did damn good. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but you know, these, these are exceptions. Yeah. You know, especially, you know, you. I don't think you could ever get a pitcher out of the minors and just throw him right on a major league pitching yeah. mound. I think he'd get killed. Yeah. Dick Miller, tell us a little bit about the little league baseball. Well, uh, going back into the, uh, uh, well, this was around 1968 when. Uh, uh, I was asked to develop a, a ball for Dudley Sports to uh, that would be acceptable for little league play, and, and so uh, what I had to do was, was come up with something cheaper and better than whatever was on the market at the time. And so Dr. Creighton Hill found out that I was uh, using the Cincinnati Reds to uh, use the, the ball for practice and, and things like that. And they had accepted it. They had adopted the ball. And so uh, what we were trying to also do at this time was I, I was helping him try to figure out, is there some way that you can de determine whether or not somebody is, is worth millions of dollars to, to sign contracts? And, and can you predict if, if this guy is ever going to make it? And so what we were trying to do was go through the, the, uh, what we figured out to be very important was the maturation of the, the, the body of, of the ideal baseball player. We started out with the hands and the arms and the, the different muscles and the, we came up with the whole structure of the body uh, trying to figure out, is this guy going to be worth millions of dollars? And, and uh, so... Uh, we were able to prove some points in there, but uh, to, to prove whether or not somebody uh, w was going to be worth millions of dollars, uh, we, we, we fell short of the target. Uh, but, uh, but at any rate, we, we, Creighton Hill comes down to my office and, and so he heard about the ball and, and the, what Cincinnati was doing with it. And so, uh, He's sitting in my office and he said, uh, Dick, he said, uh, what would you've come up with there? He says, did you have anything that I, uh, we could work with so that I could tell uh, you, you know, that the little league that we need to adopt this ball? And, and so I, I just called my secretary and I said, did you know, to, to her, uh, Charlene, and I said, uh, Dr. Cahill wants to see, see the, the work that I have done on the uh, Little League Baseball. And so she, she hands a copy over to him. Lo and behold, I don't know what Dr. Hale's doing. Uh, he goes back the next thing I know, we're being sued because nobody else can, can, can replicate what I have come up with. Uh, it, was, it was a very unique uh, uh, baseball. And, uh, so the next thing uh, we uh, uh, we start to get sued by different uh, manufacturers of balls and this, and so we, we finally settled the thing out of the court. Uh, I didn't have anything to do with it. Uh, you know, Dr. Craig Hill just asked me for you know what I had. I didn't know what his intentions were. I uh, said so because we have been working on other projects together, and uh, so uh, it was. Um, it lasted for a couple of years, and uh, it, we uh, uh, like the fruits of our labors. You know, as it was all making, it was a success. And then uh, what we had to do was make sure everybody else had, had the same formula as I had. 
and uh, so the, the the center of the ball formula. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. had to be duplicated among yeah, all the right, all yeah, the and, manufacturers. Yeah, so so I, I I came up with the different covers that you made out of polyurethane that uh, uh, it, it was uh, better than uh, uh, the horse hide and, or yeah. uh, the cow hide. You know, depending on. Whether you were putting a horse hide on baseball or the cow hide on soft. So, did you wind up making the baseball for everybody? Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I just uh, I, I made it uh, for Dudley Sports, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, he, he uh, adopted it. Uh, I, I mean, Dr. Creighton Hill, you know, he had to back off and and uh, make make sure that everybody uh, was on a, a level playing field. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it was. It was just one, one of the uh, shortcomings of, of uh, we weren't on the working on the same page. But anyway, that's typical of getting through and getting a project done. Yeah. Just finding everybody on the same page. I was going to close out with Dick Miller, who uh, is sitting here with uh, Richard Wood, both of them uh, baseball uh, aficionados and really know their history. Dick uh, is kind of special in that regard, uh, having had a career after his time with the Marines. He eventually became a, a chemist and, a, and a, an inventor. And we know him as the father of the modern baseball, which uh, was a lot of work done in the early 60s. And uh, that gave us the consistent baseballs that we have today uh, in the market. And uh, he's the guy that got the ball rolling on that, so to speak. And Dick Miller uh, and uh, Richard Wood over here. Richard uh, is not only a, a baseball uh, fact and figure genius, but also he's, uh, he writes a blog about uh, strange and pandemonium and mysteries of uh, various murders and mayhem in the region of Florida and Alabama that we live in. And uh, his blog is at judgingshadows.blogspot.com. Yep. And uh, anyway, these are great people. And we'll try to do more of these uh, conversations on baseball and other sports and include these individuals because we're just fortunate to have these kind of brains sitting around and can tell us some interesting facts Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Dick. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Peace.